Hey everybody, this is Bailey Wiki, and we've got another episode of the, the Roll20 to Foundry transition uh, video series. If you guys are new to the series, it's really for anyone, whether you come from Roll20 or not, who's just getting into Foundry and you want to walk through the very first stages of like, how do you, how do you approach this really powerful piece of software? And then how do you as a GM kind of make the most out of it and create some really compelling experiences for, for your players while you're at it? Well, today I've got I've got some usual guests. We've got we've got Zephyr and we've got Fox, who've been who's been walking down this path with us. Hey guys. Hey, how's it going? Hello, hello. Good. Doing well. And we have another guest today that I'm pretty excited about. Um, I don't know uh, if you guys have ever followed the familiars on either YouTube or Twitch, but it's a it's a live play D and D stream. And the the GM is Joby, and Joby's with us today. Hey, Joby, what's going on? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining. And and this the reason I invited Joby to this is because I want I wanted another GM who's pretty proficient in Foundry, and I'll put an asterisk after that because we're all wondering if we're ever proficient <laughs> in anything. Yeah, but but yeah, you've been you've been GMing. I I watch your your show on a regular basis. If you guys haven't followed the familiars. It's a pretty fun uh, live game, and there's a lot of or like live game. I was at live. I know you guys pre-record, but I watch uh, most of the episodes, and it's pretty fun to to watch. And there's, I think, there's some some reasons for that. What what's the what, what's the, what are the familiars all about, Joby? Yeah, so um, we like to say that we are professional actors, unprofessional adventurers. You know, <laughs> um, it's basically me and my actor friends who are all uh, working in some way, shape, or form in film, TV, or theater across the U.S. And, you know, when stuff shut down during the pandemic, we found a lot of fun and sanity in playing Dungeons & Dragons together. And we missed performing, so we also wanted to stream it, put it up online. And so we got started playing uh, Storm King's Thunder. And that is where we find ourselves now. Um, and we are just starting our second season. The players are level eight. And um, it's, uh, well, we can talk about Storm King's Thunder itself, um, but I can say that uh, your maps have proved valuable to our game thus far. I love it. I love. I love seeing my maps getting used out there in the wild. It uh, brings me brings great joy. Um, you do. You do a lot. I mean, you're pretty prolific. I've got. I follow you on um, on TikTok. You put a lot of content out there. Just really helpful stuff for GMs in general. I would say. So, if you guys haven't heard of Joby or, or followed uh, either his either the familiars or some of his other stuff, we'll link all of those things in the description for the video because uh, I highly recommend it. It's it's pretty good fun. I and. Uh, also, I think you've got a Patreon and other things if, if people want to throw a couple nickels at you. Oh, yeah. We always will take all the nickels. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay. Well, so with that, let's let's kind of set the, set the stage here. I think what we all want to know first before you start giving us uh, all this solicited advice, Joby, is what kind of GM are you? Just so we can kind of say, like, you know, and, and by the way, what's your background in the, in the game itself in D&D? Sure. So the first time I played D&D, I think I was nine or ten, and I was in upstate New York, and of course the sort of older teenage guy who was running around the place that me and my family were vacationing at, you know, uh, I mean, straight out of Stranger Things, like, had the AD&D books and right. ran a game for us for two weeks, and it was probably, like, the most fun I'd ever had. And then I didn't play again until I was in my 30s. Um, I just went down the route of playing video games and, you know, having my hobby time be elsewhere. But then, for whatever reason, I just found myself wanting to pick up the books again. Um, and I bought the player's handbook and bought, I think, the monster manual yep. and had the classic experience of not being able to find anybody who could dungeon master. So it turned out that I was going to be the one to do it. And um, that was my entry point as an adult. And that was probably... I mean, I've only been doing this like five or six years, um, but I've pretty much only game mastered. 
Um, yeah. And I don't know y'all's experience with this, but I've I, I find that I've I'm I'm kind of a a permanent GM. I've like tried to play, and I I just I don't think any GM would actually want to play with me because I think I'd be pretty insufferable. Um, I, I just try to control their game or make them feel good about themselves or what have you. So um, I really love GMing. Um, I've done mostly published content and mostly Wizards of the Coast stuff. And uh, as as I'm sure we'll talk about with the wide open ones like Storm King's Thunder, they yeah. really lend themselves to homebrew and they lend themselves to needing to find your own maps and find your own um, assets. And the party can go a, a million different ways and to have the support of something honestly like y- y'all's maps and uh, Foundry and all of the makers here on Foundry, I've found to be um, uh, honestly indispensable. So yeah, I mostly yeah. GM published content and then find myself homebrewing within that. Great. And when you think of like the VTT experience with uh, with your players and what you prefer, where, where do you... Where do you lean in terms of like theater of the mind versus you know you know versus you've always got a map there and they're, they've always got yeah theater, like where do you land there? I always tell myself I'm going to do more theater of the mind and I <laughs> I never do I I personally love the experience when I'm at the table of laying out a map and seeing that wow factor in the players and see them all lean in and I just find that. You know, assets like that, maps, uh, minis, tokens, even in their most basic form, always invite the players to imagine deeper and to get more involved and implicated in the story. And so, yeah, I drive myself crazy just trying to make maps for everything, or at least to have an image up of what a general area looks like, what the feel is, what the vibe is, stuff like that. Yeah, that's great. I don't know if you've played with any of the AI stuff lately, like uh, Mid Journey, the others, but- uh, Oh yeah. And out, I mean, that's so nice. Oh, it's so <laughs> great. Great yeah. throwaway artwork, it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I'm getting better at writing prompts and um, uh, to have that to be filled out. And also since we stream, to have it be license free is really great. It's so good. Now, automation versus uh, calculate all the dice. Where where do you land with with that full <laughs> automation, or or do you like getting your calculator out? Oh, I just the day that MIDI Quality of Life came out as a module for Foundry was a just a fantastic day for me. I love automation. I find myself definitely going down the rabbit hole of trying to perfect my environment which I always need to pull up from, but I find that at the end of the day, when it comes to the game, it's a balance. I like to have certain things automated. Personally, when I find that there's a little bit, uh, when I err more on the side of automation, that if I click on the wrong thing, I can sometimes have to double back. Uh, that will add a little bit more time. So um, it's always a balance. It depends on who I'm playing with. It depends on if my players are well-versed in something like Foundry VTT or if they're not. And um, I I love it when the work gets done for me, but uh, I find that I have to strike a balance with the environment at any given table. Yeah, yeah. That's true. We do need to kind of know our audience. Go ahead, Vox. Is that you? That was going to be kind of my question with the automation because I've been playing with the automation a lot because I'm finding it one of the most interesting aspects from the GM side that I can just erase hours and hours and hours of my life with. Yes. But like I'm running into a challenge where I'm questioning myself if I'm putting too much automation into it that I'm kind of directing too much of where everything's going to go. So I wanted to ask you, like, do you find that even when you start adding more and more automation, is it still easy for you to adapt and change course with the automation in place? Great question. Uh, That's where the balance comes in for me. Um, I, okay, so for example, uh, auto-applying damage. 
I find that it's better for me for whatever reason to go through and when a role comes in to click on a given token and then go over to the uh, information here uh, in the in the chat and apply it as as damage, half damage, double damage, what have you. Just being in control like that, I find helps me support the improvisation of my players. So for the with the familiars, for example, I'd say half of the players have played D&D before, but the other half, this is their first time ever playing D&D. However, all of them are these incredible improvisers. So in that case, my job as GM is to help support their fun. And most of their fun is in improv. And they're not necessarily rules lawyers, and they're not necessarily folks who are going to spend a lot of time figuring out exactly how a, a given rule might support some of their fantastic improvised ideas. Yeah. In that case, it's just like, I want to be able to just take whatever number we rolled and apply it to their token. If I'm playing with min-maxers, I definitely lean more towards fully automated um, uh, aspects of the game, like through MIDI QOL. Great. That's good. Well, I know I've got more questions. I know we all do too, but maybe we can also kind of jump in and say, what the hell are we looking at here? Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So um, what we're looking at here is uh, in the town of Amphail, uh, where the characters have found themselves. So in our story, uh, the familiars have, uh, oh, just FYI, there will, there's about to be a couple of spoilers for Storm King's Thunder. Um, I'll try to keep that light. That being said, our characters have defeated one of the giant lords and are trying to figure out what they're going to do next. They have uh, become allied with various factions, and due to that fact, they're in Amphail, and they wanted to go to a bar. Now, if you go online and try to find maps for Amphail, you can find a couple different things, but there's nothing official in the book. And thus, here is where BailiWiki Maps comes in and saves the day. Um, so I can show you something that I made very quickly that was a very helpful top-down map just to give the group a sense of what is around the town and where they can go. So this Can is... Point of order. Please. I ran into this exact same issue yesterday. And I used really? another BailiWiki tavern map as well. The exact same issue. I needed a tavern <laughs> and BailiWiki saved the day. Everybody yeah. needs a tavern, guys. You know how many taverns? And I got taverns coming out of my ears. <laughs> And what's great is that your taverns aren't just taverns. Like, there's uh, there's usually stuff... The reason that I love your maps is that there's usually stuff that inspires story moments. So just for those at home, I was able to make this map here in probably half an hour with all of your assets. And it's not the prettiest, and I want to go in and make some detail work, but for my players, it's mind-blowing for them just to have this, uh, to be able to drop their tokens in. And it's also very helpful so that they know exactly where they could go to buy certain things or to go to the church or to, you know, get a horse, what have you. Anywho, of course, they go to a tavern first. So uh, I loaded up your, uh, I believe traditionally this is the yawning portal or it could work as the yawning portal. Um, right, but, this is uh, a variant of it. Right, with right. The fighting pit, you know. Cue the music, Zephyr. So, um, the party wanted to go to a tavern. And I knew that there was a couple of story things that I wanted to have happen, so I went over to your module and just looked for a tavern and popped it in and one with a fighting pit came up 
And I thought, okay, great. Our character, Rooster, who is a dragonborn barbarian, always wants to fight. And I thought that while we were doing these other fun story points, that there was going to be a, an, some unarmored combat, uh, non-lethal, going on Love in it. the middle of the bar. So I'm doing these various story points, and the people in the party are talking to the super important prisoners that are being held upstairs. You can actually see this in a couple weeks on our app. And then I'm getting ready to run this you know, boxing match between this half orc. By the way, this is a token created on Mid Journey. Pretty sweet. Nice. And our character, Rooster. And of course, Rooster starts this non lethal combat by using their breath weapon. And it turned into this barroom brawl where our tiefling cleric worthy had gotten a little bit too drunk at the bar and started uh, throwing rooster their weapon casting spiritual weapon themselves we had our uh, half elf ranger Justan trying to quell and calm the room and the entire episode takes place in the middle of your map and none of it would have happened were it not for the fact that I on a whim, threw in a map with a fighting pit in the midst of it. And now the party has completely destroyed their relationship with the Lord's Alliance. They are in danger of getting arrested and brought in front of Lyrell Silverhand herself and or having to flee town. None of this was part of my plan. All of this is why I love GMing. And it is all because of, and I'm sure you guys can attest to this, like, the bits of story that are embedded in detailed maps like this that you may not fully recognize, but your party definitely will. Yeah, they and, pick up on things. Yeah. yeah you, it, you know, I do the same thing. I look at like what I sometimes I just find myself browsing some interesting things that people are making and that will drive the story points or at least something I think might the, the party might latch on to, right? Yeah, it's um, it's it's. It takes weight off of my shoulders as a game master. And I've got to constantly remind myself that not only do I not need to, it's futile to try to plan everything. I need to go through a checklist, which I do have in front of me, of like my basic ingredients for a session, and then really coach myself to stop when I am done and let the party play the game. And during the session, my job is to curate that as best I can and support their fun and stuff it like also, this really helps. It also seems right. like Bailiwick he needs to start generating some maybe like uh, uh, jails and jail cells for yeah. party members when they get too drunk. At least for us, I mean, the familiars yeah. really need more jails. Um, yeah, it, maybe it should even be a base. Um, <laughs> yeah. for your for your crew. Yeah, um, I love it. So as I'm looking at this, I'm looking at the scene, um, how you set this up. What other kind of setup are you thinking about? Like, I don't know, what's helpful? Do you, can you kind of show us sort of behind the DM screen sort of yeah. what you're, like, what are your modules that you're using? And like, you know, what's your kind of, what do you have sort of walking into your session? Sure. So I basically did what you guys told me to do and <laughs> went with, uh, the sort of full spectrum module setup to support y'all's maps. And through that, I have gotten to know uh, Ripper's amazing module work and Monk's um, uh, Moulinet. Um, uh, all of these are ways that have just allowed my virtual tabletop to feel much more like a table. There's a, there's, there's a learning curve to Foundry VTT, but it's definitely not as steep as I thought it was. And as long as you just go one module at a time, you can really make this thing do almost anything that you want. And so I'd say the places where I started were uh, having things like Dice So Nice, which is pretty much standard for um, I think most foundry tables and linking that with roll table just to have these nice little icons down here. And then I think the next step I went was like, I just want 
I want my table to look awesome. And th that's when I found y'all's maps. And so let me just set up. So what, here's what I've got to do for next session. Let me just tell you sort of like what I'm looking at. So they're going to get arrested or they're not going to get arrested. And I'm thinking that they're probably going to make it out of town. And when they make it out of town, they're going to have to pick a direction to head through the Sword Coast. And I'm going to start using the random uh, encounter table that you can find in Storm King's Thunder. Now, before I found y'all's maps, this would have been a ton of work to try to wrap my head around all of the various places that our party could end up. But now what I can do is I've already loaded some of this stuff up. I can get something like Sample Wilderness 34 by 34. And many of the places that they could go can be here. And what we've got here is this awesome, you know, varied wilderness map that's going to fit almost anywhere uh, in, in any of the encounters that the party is going to find themselves in. And what's amazing is it's got stuff set up like, well, first of all, places to hide, places to get cover, places to get elevation. I mean, we've got an archer that loves to find the strategic place to, you know, kill as yeah. many monsters as they can. They're going to want to look for elevation. It's already set up. I don't have to even worry about it. And also, I love their stuff like, you know, I see this cart and immediately my mind as a GM starts going like, okay, well, who is here? Um, what have they left? Uh, my party, as every party does, loves magic items. What magic item am I going to put in there? And right. my session starts to get made for me as opposed to having to start from zero. So this is immediately, you know, anywhere from three to five of the random encounters. But now let's say that I needed to make something a little bit more customized. You know, I'd open up one of your templates. And what's nice is that it's not totally blank. It's, there's already some, some vibe here. And very, very quickly, I mean, I have done things like this in the middle of a session while I'm, you know, basically acting the magician, like being like, look over here, look over here. Right. Um, I'll be like, you know, they'll, they'll be role playing. And I'll just drop in a template like this, and I will use something like Moulinette to start searching for things. I always, of course, as everyone should do, filter for Bailiwicky's assets. And I'll just drop in a couple of assets here. What's amazing about these assets, as you can see in all of the videos that you guys have made that are amazing walkthroughs, is that they already have everything set up. So I'm not concerned about dropping in walls. I'm not concerned about dropping in different levels. It's already there for me. And so I can drop in my buddy Rooster here and they are going to be able to get underneath the trees. My player's minds are going to be utterly blown when they're going through this. Now, I'd say the other thing I do, which is um, since I run so much D&D stuff, is using um, uh, the D&D Beyond importer and using uh, game lock. So a lot of my players are have low tech setups. They're not gamers themselves. So they don't have the powerful desktops. They don't have the like super high powerful laptops. And so the way we do it is that I run everything off of my computer. I screen share what I'm doing and they have D&D Beyond up. And stuff like uh, game log are, are so amazing. Like right now I've got my iPad up and I'm going to just roll a strength check here off of my iPad and you can see how quickly it's coming up. Um, it's super, super duper quick. And what's nice through MIDI QOL, you can link it to things like Dice So Nice. So it makes really a very, good. it's so good. It makes a super awesome interface for my players who if I had them have to learn Foundry themselves, it'd be a huge barrier to entry. So stuff like that makes my life and my player's life a lot better. And then if I want to throw in a monster, uh, I've already done the muncher, which is part of the uh, DD Beyond importer. And so I can go in and drop in, you know, my adult black dragon. Sorry, Rooster. 
um, and it. have them go at each other. And it's that quick. Um, so my, the way that I run things and the way that my life works, I'm, I'm a husband, I'm a parent, I've got a job. I love this. And I probably have an hour to maybe three hours a week to prep a session. And it's imperative that I am able to work um, quickly and efficiently and not have to double up things. And what's great about it's great. The, I, yeah. I love that you're doing the D and D beyond importer. We covered that with box, a uh, walk through that uh, ourselves oh. in, in an earlier episode and how, how much that brings, especially if you're going to use, um, you know, just the adventures that you can, uh, that you can get from wizards of the coast all the way through, you know, into, into foundry. I yeah. really like what you're doing with just sharing the screen and just eliminating any, uh, issues with potatoes and other machines that you know people might be running because you know you can get pretty advanced with the with the effects in Foundry. And I think I've even seen you do some three D stuff, things like that. And you know you don't want you don't want to have to uh, sort of design um, and have to consider you know everybody's uh, machines that they're using. So that's a, that's a really good tip. Big time. Yeah, most definitely. Love it. Okay, great. Okay, I think I'm getting a good feel for for how you approach setup. Uh, anything else that you want to show us, or, or do you do much with with journals and things like that, handouts? Like, how much are you investing in, uh, you know, artwork and yeah, that sort of thing. Um, so I have tried a bunch of different setups when it comes to using Foundry's journal system, and for whatever reason it kind of goes back to the conversation about like automation versus pen and paper doing things yourself. I have in the vein of efficiency set up Google doc templates to help me basically fill in the blank for my sessions. And I've got a video about this on our channel where um, I walk through just how I set up my Google Doc and Google Drives. And in that video, you can link to a shared folder where I just offer up the Google Doc templates for free. And um, basically I take that copy, the template, make a new one. And so I don't have to reinvent the wheel every session. I just, I'll know I'm done when the sheet is filled. Good. And I haven't yet transferred that into Foundry because I like the ability to be walking around with my phone in my pocket. And if I get an idea, I can open up my drive and fill it into the, to the dock right there, come home and it's ready to rock. So and module developers listening to this, I've mm -hmm. been wondering the same thing. Why can't I do game prep from my phone whenever I feel like it, right? So uh, <laughs> if somebody wants to develop a Google Doc integration or something with, with Foundry's awesome uh, journal system, I'm, I will promote it and I will do a video on it. Yeah, um, seconded. That, that's yeah. good. But I, I've seen that video of yours, Joby, and it really is, it's a great like distillation of like, hey, if you check these boxes, you're walking in pretty good uh, yeah. into any session. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I find that for just being a game master, I don't know about y'all, but being a perfectionist myself, you know, it can just turn into this black hole of just endless work. And then you get to the session and 3% of it will be used by the players. And right. um, I, I, I swear by it. I, I have to sort of stick to it so that I make sure that I have the things that I need and then let the session go the way it's going to go. Yeah. When you're running a session, what do you have two screens up? Do you, um, you, do you have, I assume you have your notes up? Like what, what what's, what's mm -hmm. your up display as you're running a session so yeah i've got two i've got two screens uh and throughout my time dming the familiars that has grown to three i just migrated back to two because you know um <laughs> to chill out but um so less is more yes and giving myself a some smaller parameters is is helpful so what I've got up is, you know, obviously I've got my DM view, which you can see here. 
and then I've got an incognito Chrome window up for the player's view. So what we're streaming now, when we stream, obviously if the map is up, is the player's view, which frees me up a ton to do anything that I need to do off stream, off camera, and away from the player's view to help surprise them and you know keep that level of suspense up. Um, since we are also using D and D Beyond, I've got D and D Beyond up. I've got our campaign view up and the game log up. When you watch our stream, the game log you're seeing is the game log from D&D Beyond. And then we do live streamed music, uh, a lot of which I composed myself. And I just started using Monument Studios, amazing collection of wow. high def, uh, fully realized fantasy music. If you don't know about them, they're awesome. And I think I got it on sale, this huge library of super high def music for like 20 bucks. And some of the files are too big to put into Foundry's existing sound setup, but a lot of them aren't. And they've got a lot of awesome one shot sounds that I would also highly recommend checking out that you can definitely toss into something like Moulinette's, uh soundboard um, Foundry setup as well. And then... Um, but I, I do I do most of our sound through Ableton Live. I'm also a musician, and so it's just sort of the, I have that ready to rock. And um, and then on top of that, I have now migrated back to having my Google Docs printed out in front of me with all of this high tech stuff. When it gets into the session, I need to be clicking as little as possible. I find. Yeah. And having the session sheet in front of me, I have um, uh, spell cards and um, information about characters and, 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 and things like that in front of me with a pen and a blank sheet of paper that, uh, God forbid, anybody should look at that sheet of paper after the session. I mean, I think that they would commit me because I would look like an insane person. But for whatever reason, I find just taking notes like that or if and when technology fails us, which occasionally it does, being able to write down the initiative order super duper quick, uh, being able to take notes on hit points and damage conditions, stuff like that. It's just sometimes better for me personally, and I can upload that stuff later to Foundry if I need to. But that's basically it. Yeah. Love it. Is there anything you're, you've done to help set up your players for success? It sounds like you have. I mean, you've sort of reduced it down to where they just need to interact with the, the D&D Beyond. Yeah, pretty much. And that's super specific. I've got my another group of friends that I DM for sometimes that all have the gaming computers, right? They all have the high tech setups. And my role as a GM for them is super duper different. Um, they are going to have me covered when it comes to a technical, the basic technical proficiency of like setting up their own account on something like the Forge and stuff. But um, as we all do, like, I love introducing D&D to new players, and I like doing it across the internet. And so I find that something like Foundry is actually conducive to that. And my recommendation for GMs who might find themselves using Foundry and wanting to introduce their fellows to something like D&D is that using things like Discord, using things like Zoom, and just sharing your screen and putting yourself in control, if you're sharing something like the player's view, it can be super helpful for folks that just need to have a couple of sessions with the character sheet up in front of them. And things like game log and um, things like uh, uh, the D&D Beyond Importer, you know, if you're using things like Wizards of the Coast stuff and and Dungeons and Dragons proper, it's it it, it can easily be done. And yeah. I, the only thing that I'd add on top of that is that sometimes taking player agency away from being able to move their tokens themselves is really good for role playing because they have to describe what they want to do and where they want to go. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I found it to be super helpful in just getting people to role play. Um, so it's this added kind of silver lining to, um, honestly, if you're running into that issue with, you know, your hardcore gamer buddies, just 
changing the permissions in Foundry that it's themselves in Foundry itself to like have them not be able to control their tokens yeah. or using the game pause function. I would highly recommend it if you want them to talk more. Love it. Love it. Yeah, that's the one thing that like we kind of struggle with with it is kind of the role playing becomes very fragmented just because mm -hmm. they're so um, caught up on trying to remember all of the basics, like what type of role to roll or I can't tell you how many times like they walk into the room and it's just like, okay, I want to do an arcana check to see if there's anything magical in this room. It's like, okay, uh, right. what are you looking for? You know, or it's like, or I want to find something in this room. Okay, what are you going to roll? Are you going to roll an investigation? Are you going to roll? And they're always asking me what to do. So I find that like the more that I can get some of those decisions out of their hands, sometimes it they can stay in character and play more, and they're not ending up asking a bunch of questions all the time. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think you know, Foundry can do some of this, and your setup can do some of it, but also, you know, I don't want to have too many conversations and with my players before we start because. I find that just getting folks to dive in is, I don't know, it, 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 you learn so much more sometimes by just yeah. jumping off the deep end and doing it. Um, yeah. But I also, I, we just had this conversation with, I just had this conversation with the familiars that, you know, I was watching some old tape and I mean, we're all, uh, our group especially is we're professional performers. We, we love improvising and even we can fall into the trap of asking, asking permission instead of forgiveness. And what I try to tell my players is definitely flip that, like always ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Just tell me what you want to do. And my job as the GM is to understand how to break that down. I mean, because we're talking about combat. I, I, mostly we're, we're talking about this in regards to combat. My job is to be able to help you break that down into action, bonus, action, movement. And it's so much more fun when... <laughs> I, honestly, I think it was this conversation that helped Rooster just be in character and right. say, I as Rooster would absolutely use my breath weapon and just spray poison all over this half orc, which then the, the session just went beautifully. I mean, I was well, sweating buckets, but you know, it was great. Well, they, that's what they say about improv, right? It's, it's, it's the, well, it's the mistakes where you get all the, all the gold. That's where it is. Uh, it, and it's, it's the unplanned things that, uh, that you end up spinning you into a bunch of fun. So yeah, I love it. And that's well, why. guys, any, any other questions for Joby? Well, I was yeah. hoping he could kind of like maybe show us how quickly he can run through some of these things like in a combat scene or, or whatnot with the interface that he has set up. Because, you know, like I noticed that like I've been digging into macros a little bit to kind of help sure. me. And I noticed that like there aren't any in your quick keys. So I'm kind of yep. like, okay, questioning myself now, like. Is this something I really <laughs> need to rely on or am I wasting a bunch of time? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, all right. So let's say that these two folks get into a fight as they just did. I'm just going to select them. I'm going to toss them in and I'm going to head over to, are all these guys in here? Oh, this is, I'm sorry. This is the combat that's already going. Let me trash this. All right. I would be oh, saying yeah, something. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, it's cool. I'm just going to have to rebuild everything. <laughs> no, that's cool. Uh, oh, if, uh, just hit it. So that's now empty. Toss man. Boop. And I've got uh, the modules that help me roll for everybody here. So I'm just going to do that. You can see that I am trying to allow for the different dexterity bonuses to affect stuff. But here we go. We're going to begin combat. And so what a lot of folks would do is open up in, within Foundry, which you can totally do. And if my, if my new players, for example, get stuck, it's awesome that I can just, from my DM screen, open up 
in Foundry and help roll for them. So that would be something that I would do to help a new player. It's just open this up. What do you want to do? I want to use my Warhammer. Great. Okay. So I would do it there. However, I've also got D&D Beyond up on my iPad and I've got Rooster up here. And so what I would do uh, is they would describe what they wanted to do. I would head over to their actions and I would attack. And here it's coming in. And you can see the roll there. We're going to imagine that that was a much higher roll, even though Booster, way to go. You got a plus seven. And here comes the damage. Nice, healthy amount, 10, 11. Right. Okay. So then, as I had said before, I just like clicking on the opponent and applying damage. Boom. Nice. Uh, switching over, I would then. Switch the turn over to my buddy here, Scrim. And here is where I, as the GM, would use Foundry's built-in character sheet. And I am going to roll here. What I like about having my characters and players use D&D Beyond is that these roles are not private, which I enjoy. I like that they can see um, what the base role is uh and if i was a gm um i probably would around a table i probably would roll publicly so i like that they can see that a 19 i like that they don't know that it's a 24. that's always a nice surprise for the players to sort of be able to intuit what kind of bonuses the people yeah. they're fighting have so yeah. um and that's definitely going to hit rooster because rooster wasn't carrying their shield uh, and as Rooster and I always forget, I always forget about Rage every single time. So, um, developers, if you could also figure out a way to get inside my brain, that would be super helpful. Um, that being said, I then would just go in here really quickly, roll some damage. And here it comes. And again, I like that they can see that it's a six. They don't know that it's a nine. And I'm just clicking over to Rooster and boom. We're in, so we're in it. And it's that quick. Um, so there are tons of ways that you can automate this entire thing. And to answer yeah. your question about macros, I also used to have all five folders filled with macros. And that was super helpful, uh, for certain groups. For whatever reason, I find that what you just saw is the quickest, most intuitive way for me to do it and not make too many mistakes that I have to fix. Uh, uh, on the back end. Well, I'm glad we had this conversation now, because now I'm just like, okay, it does seem a lot more efficient the way that you just did it. I just need some mm -hmm. practice because I've probably, I can't tell you how many hours I've blown going down this macro hole. Oh, I'm right there with you. I mean, yeah. Me too. I, too many hours. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> it is nice to have so many community Good. developers willing to yeah. hold my Good. hand through it. So to shift the conversation away from macros, I did have one other question. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned handling a lot of things either on pen and paper or using D&D Beyond. So how do you manage custom items? Like if you made something like a key or a piece of equipment that you created specifically for your game, uh, how exactly are you managing that? Totally. That is all pen and paper for us. And I know that Foundry has like amazing support and modules have amazing support for custom items and... I mean, all, all different kinds of customization. That's where I like throw my, my husband dad card down onto the table. And I'm just like, it has to be pen and paper. Your characters, you must be recording your inventory your, yourselves. Um, and if you forget to put it down, then your character forgot to pick it up. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's, it, 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 and again, like, I don't mean to be, um, prescriptive at all like that is just what works best for this group that is half veterans and half newbies the most efficient way to our story is to let foundry and the you know bailey wiki's maps and like you know uh, all of the things that you just saw do the job that they do and we rely on our pen and paper to do the rest gotcha uh i think that approach makes a ton of sense um follow up on that uh, what about custom weapons or armor that have special effects because mm -hmm. since you're using the roles with D&D beyond that might get trickier doing pen and paper for it 
we call you know if you just have it written down then you're yeah. not sending the roles directly to foundry let's see here i think rooster oh well no we haven't so the only crazy one that we have thus far is one of the characters picked up an orb of dragon kind and for those of you who don't know it's an awesome sentient magic item and it's not I mean, that's straight out of the book, so it's not customized. I mean, to be perfectly honest, we just haven't dealt with it too much yet in this group. Yep. And so um, uh, now that you have mentioned it, I'm like, oh, gosh, okay, yeah. How, how am I going to deal with that? Do that? <laughs> yeah, how, how am I going to do that? Um, well, I know that D&D Beyond has some really solid uh, homebrew options for creating custom items and equipment and everything. So that could be a way I could see uh, that being handled. But... You know, you mentioned the Orb of Dragonkind, and that's directly from a book, so you haven't really had to deal with the custom items. Uh, I think if you're running a game like you are, where you're mostly using D&D Beyond a pen and paper, it makes a lot of sense to just only pull items from the books or from D&D Beyond or in other compendia. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, it's a nice parameter. To, I think that's a good way of putting it. Like, it, instead of making something up, I definitely will be looking for something that already exists because i gotta remember there's all there's a ton of stuff that, that's in there that um is super duper helpful yeah and yeah what i've kind of been toying around with some of that is like you know i a lot of my players come from like the world of warcraft i you know like games Go ahead. so they think that like everything that they killed needs to drop some type of magical weapon yeah man <laughs> And yeah, so, like what I've kind of been toying around with the idea with is D and D Beyond has like such a creative way of being able to create characters and items and things like that. I've thought about telling my guys go make what you would think would be a great item, nice. achieving a really high level goal in this campaign, and then I get to decide when you get it. That's badass. I, I would. Uh, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Very invested there, right? Yeah. Because, you know, my one of my biggest challenges is getting people to come back week after week after week to try to complete the campaign. Life gets in the way, and it's just like, mm -hmm. I know they have more vested interest in it than they're more apt to show up and want to play and actually progress the game because they have no idea when I'm going to give it to them. I just may roll a, a die. You, you, you stumbled over this satch in the middle of the woods three yep. quarters of the way through the campaign and found your great bow or whatever yeah that's great i think another way to get players invested i i have my uh players design their own um characters in hero forge because i want to be able to use them in 3d and i want to be able to capture different perspectives and different poses so i found it works really really well yep there's a hero forge and they just love it they they yeah. spend meticulous hours uh just getting you know the stash the right color and uh, what weapons do I want to have? And it just, you know, they're so invested just after the design process. I can imagine you could do something similar with, uh, with you know, something like Mid Journey, where you say, hey, you know, go, go develop an avatar on there and um, go through a hundred iterations, so I don't have to. Yeah. Um, but then they're then they're invested. You know, in my group, uh, we use Hero Forge to create our minis and our portraits and everything, and it's really opened my eyes as a player how much that informs some of my other role-playing decisions. You know, for example, if I'm going to pull out a tool, I know exactly where that tool is on my person. So I know, okay, I'm reaching across my body and pulling yes. out the tool. And so it's really incredible how creating this artwork can give you a lot of inspiration, not only as a DM, but also as a player. I agree with you. I love all these different tools that we have now that are online. And um, th th I find that sometimes when I'm sitting down in front of like a blank session sheet, nothing comes. But when I start doing something like working with Mid Journey or Hero Forge, that's like this sort of like, when I focus on something else, so many of the little details just start to filter in. And um, uh, or when I use, you know, one of these freaking sweet maps, you know, like with this big fighting pit in the middle of it, that's where the story is going to really start to take off. And I love that we have these tools now. Mid Journey, I mean, it's just so mind blowing the stuff you can do in there now. Two of our, I've got this one too. Again, like we needed a barkeep. And I think, forget how I came up with this guy, but just a couple of words. And now this barkeep, I just really want them to go talk to him because he's just like, full character and he wouldn't have been that if it weren't for a tool like mid journey yeah you can start with an actor a well-known actor out there you can combine them together cross between yeah. 
two actors. It's really, really mind blowing. Yeah. Well, listen, Joby, this was this was awesome. I'm sure we'll get another session like this, but I appreciate you walking us through your setup and how you're approaching these and just how you're running combat. Um, for those of you who haven't checked out uh, the familiars, we're going to link to it in the show description. I highly recommend it. When when do you guys air? When did when does each episode on, come out? Uh, we're got we're on Tuesday nights, uh, seven p.m. Pacific, ten p.m. Eastern every week. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. Um, looking forward to the next one. And yeah, also just following Joby on places like TikTok and stuff where he's just always putting out really helpful stuff as, as a GM. If you want to hear more of the, like what you heard today, um, I found it very helpful just to orientate me always in a, in a, in a good direction. And I think with that, um, this, was, this was a great little session. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I, I appreciate it. I, I, I'm kind of inspired and not so overwhelmed. I thought my uh, UI and stuff was starting to get a uh, bit overwhelming. And now that I've seen yours, I'm just kind of like, okay, I'm kind of on par. I kind of see it's about the same. So now it's just familiarizing. Yeah, man. Yeah, totally. Yeah. As, as you said, less is more. Less is more. Less is more. And we have to give ourselves permission to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. All right. As long well, as you got those sweet maps. That's right. Well, we do try to make it like kits, right? Where you just, I, I'm, like I said, I'm a Lego kid and I, I like to have a box of Legos that I can put stuff together with. So, you know, and that's what we want as GMs. We want like a kit, right? We want stuff where we can just kind of pull out of things quickly and sort of have it done for us. And and I need that in lots of other areas besides the mm -hmm. map making. So it's always helpful. Uh, well, all right. Thanks, guys. It's another another fun session. Joby, we'll uh, see you soon. And for those, I'll just drop this at the very end for those who won't get to this the end, which is going to be most. We're actually looking at doing a live game here uh, probably really soon, maybe in November. There's going to be some notable people, maybe some people on this call, definitely some notable people in the Foundry community that you guys uh, at this point have, have got to know and love. So we're putting that together now. I uh, definitely recommend you uh, following the channel if you want to catch wind of when that's going to happen. Um, but in the meantime, everybody have fun playing your games and have fun making your maps. Hey, yeah, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. guys. Next time. Have a good one, everybody.